So good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Tristan Nito. I'm uh, president and founder of a non-profit organization called uh, Mozilla Europe. Uh, you may have heard about our main product called uh, Mozilla Firefox. And I'm here uh, with uh, Anthony, Anthony Enrico, here on stage, uh, who is a web developer um, and open source contributor. Uh, he has a history of contributing to um, <coughs> What's the name of this browser again? Uh, it's a fruit company. I uh, can't remember. Anyway, so he used to contribute to Safari, but he's seen the light, uh, and he, he came in and is contributing to uh, Firefox now. But I, I, I like him anyway. So, um, uh, apologies for this, this presentation, which is quite a mess. Um, I was told yesterday, I think around 7, that there was a slot available and it would be nice to have a Firefox presentation. And so um, I had like literally no slides, nothing to show. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Anthony for joining me. Uh, we had uh, uh, room service lasagna in, in my room, and so we created this, pr this presentation yesterday evening instead of going to the beer event. And so it's a, kind of a big sacrifice. So, uh, <laughs> I know. We, we did have a bottle of wine anyway, so no beer, but wine instead. Uh, it's, but it was not really a party. Uh, well, I am... Um, I'm going to talk to you about me mostly three things. The one is uh, the cloud phenomenon and what's, what's going on, how Firefox uh, is changing in this regard uh, with Firefox 4, and we'll also talk about the browser as a, uh, as a platform, uh, and this will include uh, demonstrations uh, by um, Anthony. I was uh, actually very pleasantly surprised this morning by uh, Eben Moglin's uh, talk. Who in this room has attended Eben Moglin's talk this morning? Raise your hand. Uh, well, not enough people, let me tell you. Well, it's better than nothing. Um, Eben, uh, who's a, an amazing guy, uh, actually had a very nice words uh, for uh, Firefox. Uh, that was cool. But also, mostly he had, um, he had a discussion about privacy and network centralization, which is very close to my heart. And so it was a, a pleasure uh, to hear uh, Eben discuss these, in my opinion, very important issues. Um, so whether we want or not, the cloud, the cloud uh, paradigm is, is taking over uh, uh, information technology. Everything, it's, it's the big, big trend uh, this decade of you know, moving to the cloud. And I don't think we can stop it. But if we cannot stop it, how can we make sure that we as users, as uh, free software developers um, and citizens of the internet, how can we ensure that we have the maximum control over what's going on? So this is, this is one thing I want you to keep in mind during this, this discussion today, uh, is the cloud is, is happening, but Firefox is the product that we Mozilla as an organization are producing in order to uh, remain in control as much as possible with our data and our future. So while the cloud is taking over uh, IT, um, the browser needs to evolve. Like remember a decade ago, the browser basically was something to display a web page a static web page like a Wiki Wikipedia web page. I'm not dismissing Wikipedia in any way, but you know, it's a very static document that evolves maybe a couple of times a day or a month, but it's a very static document. 
now we're talking about web applications. How many of you use a webmail? Raise your hand. All right. So many of you know what a web application is firsthand. Um, so a web application is not a document anymore. I mean, there is a lot of things going on, uh, downloading new emails, writing, composing emails, and, and, and stuff like that. The page itself is evolving in real time. The browser has to evolve uh, in this regard. An issue the browser had was it had limited capabilities as a development platform. I mean, it was meant to display web page, static web pages. Now, now that we're moving to web apps, how does it work? Many things have to be changed, and this is what we're going to see today. Privacy and centralization, how we cope uh, with this. And also, as the world is going mobile, as many of us have now things like cell smartphones, cell phones, we carry around. Um, which in turn fuels the interest for the cloud itself. I mean, I don't want my data to be on my computer or at home or on my cell phone. Basically, I want data to be in the cloud and I can access it from any device I want. This is what fuels the interest for cloud computing. Um, so there is good. With, that, with, with cloud computing, but this means you also need a mobile web browser that you can trust. Uh, so I'll start by discussing Firefox 4 uh, in terms of uh, user interface and user facing features. Uh, what we have, what we have done uh, with Firefox 4, where, where things that are new. One thing that we have is a uh, uh, tab on top. So the tabs now are here. These are a screenshot from a Windows version. Um, I'll show you on Linux what it, uh, what it, uh, how it shows. Um, with generally a new, a new theme, new uh, look and feel. Uh, the location bar, uh, which makes sense, is now uh, closer uh, to the content, because actually it relates to the content. Um, you will see uh, in Windows and uh, soon on Linux, it's disab disabled by default, but we can fix that. Um, you will see that there is no more uh, menu bar. So overall, the idea is to limit the importance of uh, the Chrome real estate uh, on the screen. Chrome uh, being not only a competing browser, but Historically, the Chrome is the name of the user interface of the browser. Now, it's confusing that they took this as a product name. Um, but in, in, in the browser vendor jargon, uh, this is what you call the Chrome. And this, too, is the, the piece of the browser that you see, uh, which is not the content. So we, we wanted to reduce this to the maximum. So uh, no menu bar. Uh, and you know, shaving a pixel here and there in order to have maximum space on the screen for the content or the web applications. And tabs on top is, uh, is one way of achieving this. Another thing we have um, is, some, is a feature called switch to tab. As you have more and more tabs open, because I don't know if you're like me, but basically, the browser is, is the piece of software that I run like 24-7. Uh, it's, it's where my life is. Uh, and so I have many, many tabs open. And when I want to look for something, when I want to access some information, because the location bar in Firefox is smart, this is what we call the awesome bar, you, start, you open a new tab, start typing what you're looking for, and the suggestions here, if you start typing wiki, it suggests wikipedia.com, which is .com, come on. Well, anyway, um, or it could suggest, in this case, which is new in Firefox 4, you already have a Wikipedia tab open, so it suggests 
that you go to the existing tab, which has Wikipedia, instead of opening yet another Wikipedia tab. Uh, so it prevents you in the end, when you start you know, cleaning up the mess in your tabs, from s closing like 20 Wikipedia tabs that were open at the same time, which doesn't make sense. So this is one nice feature, which is so switch to tab. We are suggesting to move to the tab, which is already open, instead of reopening um, a new tab. And the Firefox button you see there on the top left corner uh, is basically uh, a, a menu, well, a list of options. Uh, if, you, if, if you're not displaying the menu, then you have that. Uh, because we've been studying very thoroughly uh, with our user experience people uh, what are the, the items that are actually used in the browser. And we've seen that many of them are not used. And so we decided to remove them uh, and, and put them in, in this uh, Firefox button uh, so they, they are not in the way and, and they save space for, for the content. Uh, app tabs is, uh, is pretty neat. And uh, actually, you know what? I am, I'm going to uh, demo it for you. Um, I don't know where I stand. Um, okay, the, it looks like the network is pretty uh, limited. Anyway, Twitter is something I use pretty often. Uh, so what I'm going to do is right click on it. Oh, it's, sorry, that's the French version. Hmm. <laughs> Fail. Uh, and I, I can click there. No, that's okay. Well, this is, uh, in English, you would read uh, pin as app tab. And look at my uh, Twitter tab. It's going to switch to the left. There you go. And now it, it's, it's here. But it's a tiny, uh, it's a tiny icon. doesn't take a lot of space uh, in a tab bar. And if I open new tabs here, you see that my Twitter is still here, you know? So it's, uh, it stays there. So you can do that, for example, uh, this, is, this is my blog, maybe it's, some, it's, it's a place, or maybe it's, I don't know, it's Gmail or whatever, you know, uh, your webmail, you want to access it very often. And instead of having it lost in a sea of tabs, you right-click on it and you say uh, pin as app tab, and there it goes. It's here. So it takes tiny space, uh, and it's very, very efficient um, for, when, you know, to save uh, space for, for the web apps you use often as opposed uh, to random tabs. Uh, what else did I want to show? Where is it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, another one is uh, Panorama. Panorama is a way to manage uh, your tabs. So if you have, and I, I wish I could sh show it to you, but because I don't have a good internet connection, it's not going to be uh, very interesting. But basically. Panorama is a button that uh, you click on the top right corner uh, of user, user interface, and it enables you to put together groups of tabs. So uh, in this case, I was, I was writing an article about uh, Marshall McLuhan, a uh, famous Canadian, uh, on, on the communication theory. And so I've put all my tabs about him together in a group and all my work tabs on the, on, on the left, and I can switch from one group to the other. So it makes organizing my tabs uh, much easier. And also because it's visual and it's 2D, I, can, I have uh, the notion of where I can find easily my tabs instead of having them uh, listed on the, on the tab bar. So it's uh, pretty powerful and, and very useful. Some, something else we've been working on, uh, 
during the Firefox 4 uh, cycle is performance. And performance, believe it or not, is actually extremely complex uh, as, a, as a topic, including d very uh, different topics inc like startup time. Uh, we've made a lot of effort in uh, streamlining the uh, startup time, reducing the startup time so that the, the startup process is much faster. Um, it doesn't matter much to advanced users because Firefox is always launched like 24-7 for them. But for uh, less advanced users that tend to watch one page and then close the program and go back to email uh, and then relaunching Firefox like an hour later or so, this is important to them. Uh, so we've been working on, on this uh, startup time quite a bit. Um, the J JavaScript engine, we have a new uh, generation of, uh, of a JavaScript engine, which is called Jaeger Monkey. Um, I'll, I'll detail more uh, about the performance. We've been working on a very difficult topic, which is called hardware acceleration. Um, so I, 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 I mentioned here that your mileage may vary, because hardware acceleration basically is using uh, your GPU, basically your, your graphical processor on your graphics card, leveraging it so that it helps the browser do, do complex computation about page layouts, uh, displaying text on the screen, or 3D, or uh, decoding videos and stuff like that. Um, it is, the, the GPU is an unused uh, part of your computer that is ex extremely powerful. On the other hand, it is very complex and between Firefox and the GPU stands a very com complex bit of software which is the device driver. Um, so, well, uh, hardware acceleration works pretty well um, in, in Windows and more precisely in recent version of Windows. Uh, it's not easy to make it work on a Mac uh, and it's even harder on Linux because there is such a difference bet of quality before, uh, between certain drivers and other drivers on Linux, graphical drivers. Uh, I won't get into the mess of the uh, NVIDIA proprietary drivers versus open drivers and stuff like that, but basically we're dragged into this um, and it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. So in some cases, if you're lucky enough, if your drivers are high quality, then we can leverage them and you will see a boost in terms of performance. Um, but if we are not sure that the drivers are bug-free enough, then we disable hardware acceleration on Linux, and then you'll see a good Firefox 4, but not blazingly fast. Um, on, certain, on, on, the, on the pieces of rendering that are uh, impacted by hardware acceleration. So it's a, it's a very complicated topic. Um, just for the record, uh, Microsoft is using hardware acceleration. Uh, we've been fighting on, on who had the, the first product to do that. Uh, I claim that uh, Mozilla produced uh, prototypes of, of Firefox uh, builds uh, earlier than Microsoft. Um, we try to do that on all platforms, and Microsoft say, yeah, we can do that only on Vista and 7, uh, but XP, yeah, it's last battle. Actually, we're, we're if, if, if I'm right, uh, we're able to do hardware acceleration also on XP. It's just they don't try hard enough. Um, well, of course, there. The bottom line uh, of the, uh, at Microsoft is, is about selling more uh, versions of Vista, and uh, mostly 7. So, so, yeah, they don't care much about XP. Tons of uh, optimizations have been going on in terms of performance. Um, I won't get into details, but we call them uh, compartments, retain layers, and many others. Basically, it's uh, aggressive caching and better, better management of the code, of the code base. Uh, and one final thing is streamlining the experience. 
And this is kind of a tricky thing, but I'll, I'll save it for, for later. Uh, let's, let's start about the JavaScript uh, Yager Monkey um, uh, <coughs> engine. So these are graphs. These are benchmarks. Uh, this is the benchmark called uh, V8Bench, produced by Google. Um, so in red here, uh, this is uh, Safari. So basically, we take the Safari uh, JavaScript engine called Nitro, um, and we, we run the test regularly. We take their nightly builds, isolate their, their JavaScript engine, and run test. We run the, the, the benchmark. And it gives this, this line. Uh, we do the same with uh, Google uh, V8 JavaScript engine which is getting uh, slightly better sometimes, or worse. Uh, and we do that with a Firefox uh, Jaeger Monkey JavaScript engine. As we can see, we make a lot of progress. Uh, Mid-September, we went, the, the smaller is better, right? Lower is better. So we, we've been beating uh, regularly Safari since then, and we're approaching Google's uh, engine on Google's benchmark, which we can assume their benchmark is favorable for their own engine. You know, that's how people build benchmark. And it's last year. No, it's yes. just December and January, and, and it's even better now. OK, so we're, we're even better uh, now. Uh, this is this is Jaeger Monkey, our uh, JavaScript engine, uh, now running on SunSpider, which is Apple's uh, benchmark, and so we're better than both uh, Safari uh, and Chrome in terms of JavaScript on Apple's uh, uh, benchmark. And we also have a, a, our own benchmark where we beat everyone, of course, because it's our benchmark. <coughs> um, and we pretend, and I think we are right, but yeah, who, who knows, that our benchmark is better than their benchmark. But. Right, I won't get into that. So, uh, well, just, just to, so JavaScript, um, we're, we're, as you can see, we've made huge progress in terms of JavaScript uh, over time. So we're highly competitive, even better than others. We're very close. Um, so we've closed the gap uh, with regards to JavaScript execu execution. It's a JavaScript execution. Execution is not. It's, you know, it's just part of the performance uh, issue. But if you have very complex applications, it makes a difference. Uh, we've made already. Very significant progress between Firefox uh, 3, 5, and 3, 6, was it? Do you remember, Rick, uh, Anthony? Then with with uh, a better JavaScript engine, and it made a, a big difference for users that were running Gmail. Uh, like basically, when you when you click on the link. It changes immediately, as opposed to having to wait like half a second. And half a second for the human being, you feel like you're waiting. But if it's like under a tenth of a second for the software to react, then you have the impression it's instantaneous. And so we, we went under that tenth of a second uh, threshold, and it really made a difference for uh, using uh, Gmail. Now, in a very, very different uh, topic, I'm going to talk about performance, but mostly the impression of performance. Because let me go back there. When we, we go from here to there, frankly, users don't see a difference. We've been working really hard to go from here to there, really hard, and it's paying off. But people, they see nothing. Just it was fast before, and it's even faster after, but so little, and it was so fast before, they, they just cannot 
notice it. On the other hand, in the user interface, there are things, when you start making things differently, people see a lot of change. But actually, the product is not faster, but it gives the impression to be faster. Now, I've listed a, a, few, a few example. Let's start for the, this last one. You add a new add-on in Firefox, and instead of saying you have to restart Firefox, it says that's okay, you can use the add-on now. So you've, you've saved time by not you know, exiting Firefox and re-entering Firefox, you can use it now. So it means a lot of work behind the scenes, but it's, it really changes the way you use Firefox, install and deinstall um, an add-on. Um, reloading old tabs, you have the choice of reloading or not the old tabs, and if you reload them, you're ba we're basically loading a couple of them that are visible, and all the others, they are ready, but when you hit the tab button, then they start reloading. That means that when you restart Firefox, for some reason, it, it restarts very, very quickly. And also, uh, when you start it, that's number uh, one item, uh, it is not saying, okay, hold on, I gotta make sure that you have the latest add-ons for this version. So you do not see a pop-up that says, hold on, I'm gonna check uh, the add-ons. What we've done is we've checked the add-ons in the background during your last session, and if new add-ons are ready, and we install them then at startup, which is unnoticeable, and then you go. So it's, it's changing the product so, so that you don't have out of boxes, dialog boxes, and things that make you feel like it's painful to use it, or it's, uh, it's not responding the way you want. And it's giving you uh, the impression that it's actually much faster. It's actually really more pleasant to use than actually faster. On a very different topic, something we've done um, is raising the bar on privacy. Uh, we're very happy at Mozilla to see that privacy is actually becoming a, a topic of interest um, with uh, the European Commission, uh, with the government of the United States, uh, and also browser vendor that start to feel the heat because they're concerned there will be regulation from authorities. Uh, so this we've been fighting for uh, privacy for a while. Um, there, there are extensions such as uh, Taco and Better Privacy that, were, that have been available for a few years already. That basically uh, say, put cookies in Firefox, and these cookies that are set by advertising networks when, when an advertising network sees that cookie on your computer, then they are not going to track you. That's their promise. Whether people obey their promises is a different story, and I won't get into that, but because the advertising industry is concerned they will, that they will get regulated, they have put this mechanism into place, um, and they offer you to put these cookies so you're not tracked. Uh, now, these cookies could actually disappear, or, and so these extensions make sure these cookies stay in place. So even if they're removed, they're put back into place, and these cookies say, no, I don't want to be tracked. For each and every advertising network, I think there are like 74 of these advertising networks that have that. Other extensions, such as Adblock Plus and NoScript, for the advanced users are also available for no, seeing no advertising, um, no scripting. Personally, I tend to also use a Flash block that blocks Flash, uh, which I highly recommend. Although we have to recognize that these two plus Flash block are really extensions that are uh, for the advanced user uh, because, well, sometimes the website you're visiting doesn't work exactly like, like it should be because, 
because you're basically you've you've removed stuff from it uh, through these, ex these extensions. So unfortunately, these I would not recommend them for ordinary users that don't feel like uh, debugging websites that don't work well because of these extensions. Although they are very uh, very efficient, uh, we're we're seeing. Uh, Companies such as uh, Google and Microsoft have recently announced something similar to the extensions that we have for several years. Uh, it's good. In the case of Microsoft, they've built this into the product but because their extension mechanism is, is very crappy. But by default, there is, the, there is a kind of a blacklist of, of ad networks. And these blacklists are empty by default. So yeah, they have a do not track feature, except that you may not use it. Right. Um, uh, Google has announced they are doing something uh, similar uh, there uh, within Chrome. But they're still at level uh, number one. What's new in Firefox 4? is uh, a very simple feature uh, called uh, the uh, do not track HTTP header. Actually, I think I'm, I'm going to show it to you. Um, I, I, this, it's not going to work. It's not in beta 10? Oh, it's a, uh, OK, right. So no, I'm not going to show it to you, because uh, well, that would mean I need to uh, run another version of, of Firefox, which is a nightly build. Uh, but I, I've seen it on my other machine. <laughs> so <laughs> this is why I thought I would show it to you. It, it, it is in, Fire, in Firefox, though it's going to be in the next beta, not in the one that was just released. And one final uh, thing we're doing on the, on the privacy front is, the, is it's a service called uh, Firefox Sync. Uh, who has heard what Firefox Sync is? Raise your hand, please. All right, I, I still have to explain it. Uh, sorry for <laughs> bothering me with that. 15 minutes left. I need to hurry up because... Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, it's a service that backs up all your browser history on the server and your bookmarks and your passwords. Now, these are highly sensitive informations. So the way we do it at Mozilla is everything is encrypted by Firefox on the client side with a key that only you have. And it's sent on a, on a Mozilla server. It means that Mozilla cannot decrypt it and, and read it and understand what is your history and what are your passwords? Other browser vendors offer similar services, although they do not offer encryption. Because for them, tracking where you've been is highly valuable. Data mining, like uh, Eben Moglen ex explained this morning, is highly val ha valuable for the bottom line of these organizations. But for us, being a nonprofit organization caring about you, we do encryption on the client side, and what we see in our servers is only encrypted, unusual, unusual data that we cannot data mine. That's one thing. And the second thing is that our server is open source. It's free software. You can download the source code for it and run it on your own server. So we're also addressing the issue of centralization of this. You can run your own server of sync. And so even even if you know it's encrypted, even if you, we're good people, you may not trust us, and you may want to run this on your own server, and then we'll be fine. And we're totally OK with that. We we'll still need to run a centralized service because it's more simple for users. And finally, Firefox 4 for uh, mobile. Uh, Firefox Sync is very useful in order to synchronize your history so you can reuse it on your smartphone, like just typing a few letters on this because the keyboard is crappy. Uh, you will be able to revisit tabs that are open somewhere on your other computer. 
Firefox 4 on mobile is going to be released soon. It will be running on uh, Memo Migo and on Android. I'm running Android. Yes? Uh, how much RAM is required? I, I don't have the specs in, on top of my head, but I, I, I run it on a, on a, on a pretty good uh, Android 2.2 uh, phone. It works well, so. But I, I, this is a good machine, so um, 760 uh, May. Yes. If, um, and what's important, it's the same engine as Firefox 4. So if you can run it on Firefox 4 uh, desktop, you can run your application on, on, these, uh, on these things. Um, uh, switching over. He wants the microphone. What else? Hey, is it okay? Yeah. Um, I have to say about Firefox Sync, uh, when I joined Mozilla, I was still running Safari. <laughs> yeah, I did it for three weeks because I, I have an iPhone. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I switched when I uh, discovered Firefox Home, which is the, just a, a sync client for the iPhone. And when I'm in the subway or, or in a car, I can check my bookmarks, uh, I can check old pages, and that's when I switch back to Firefox. So, really cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, web, web features in, uh, in available in Firefox 4, but most importantly in other browsers and, uh, and in their latest versions. Uh, so I guess you've seen the HTML5 logo that the W3C is uh, promoting. Um, so HTML5, that's, um, it's an umbrella word to put everything that's web inside it. And um, so I'm not going to go into all the details because I don't have the time. Thank you, Tristan. <laughs> um, but it's about um, new web features and, and, and new design features and, new, and having powerful uh, JavaScript engines in the browser, having a, um, SVG uh, uh, as a first, uh, cl first uh, class um, technology. So SVG is about scalable graphics, so uh, highly important on mobile. Um, it's about having access to uh, the uh, to the de desktop, having access to uh, a web page when it's offline, and so there's really a lot of, of, of technology in there. So this little demo, uh, so I'm not sure you can see exactly, but there's a gradient, a radial gradient, uh, like it's uh, light orange in the center and it's going red uh, uh, over there. So that's done with CSS3. There's no image used. Um, on the bottom, uh, all the images are, in fact, videos. So I don't know if I do that, if you can hear the sound. But So it's playing. And when I click that, uh, it's opening with a transition, a rotation. It's scaling up. And so that's really not. I'm not going to say easy to do, but that's something was that, that's really easier than before to do. <laughs> oh, and by the way, okay. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm running it. Firefox uh, full screen, so on the Mac it's really new, and that's cool. Um, just Tristan was talking about Panorama. That's the way you use it. I have all my demos here, and 
Okay, thanks. I have all my demos on the on the right, and I have some links on the left for first demo. And and I can access, I can still access the app tab uh, on Twitter or, or Gmail or whatever. Again, uh, next one. Um, so let me refresh this. Okay. So um, this one is to showcase um, how. Um, we can access, um, um, we can store data in the browser and we can store code in the browser. So if you're on a mobile, you want to run a, an application, uh, if it's native or, or web, you want access to it uh, if you have access to the network or not. So uh, there's, a, there's a feature in HTML5 where you can store the code inside, uh, inside the browser. So next time you launch it, it it's not going to, Go on the network, and so you get a to do. Um, you can do a to do um, to do application really quickly and and uh, and access it everywhere. And you can also store data. Like uh, so, this demo is storing a list of all the cities in the U.S. and the zip code uh, associated to that. And so, even if I have a, uh, I don't have a good Wi-Fi here. Uh, when I'm going to search. Uh, for this one, it should work, and it's not. Oh yeah. No, I've been in. I've been. I've been in holidays there, and it's in Florida. Um, okay, let me try another one. Yeah. And so, as you as you can see, it listed everything. So you see, Florida, FL. <laughs> Um, so um, you can store it. Um, there's two kinds of storage: uh, a really quick one um, um, and simple one with the key and values. And you get also um, in this demo, it's using IndexedDB, a more complex database system uh, where you can do queries and and uh, really really cool on mobile devices. But uh, if you want to do a, a, a webmail, I know Gmail is already using some of the this stuff to store the, the emails uh, so that you get a list when you launch it real fast. And uh, okay, this one, um, yeah, it's also important to move the browser out of the web and uh, access the desktop and and some stuff like that. So if I take this picture over here. You see, I can drop it. Like uh, I don't need uh, to go into a file picker and, and search for my file. And when, when I'm going to drop it um, uh, with a powerful JavaScript engine, um, I can go into this image, um, take the data in it, extract the exif data because there's that. That's what you get in into images, and with that. Uh, I can see where the picture has been taken, uh, what is the camera, uh, uh, what else, the, the data and time, stuff like that. And so when you're on the web, you can match this with a, a service called Google Maps. And I just dropped it. I, I, I never hit enter or I never went to a server. I'm just doing this on my machine computing the data into the image, and you can see all the exif data in there. And, uh, and especially the GPS latitude. And then I'm using it to insert uh, a Google map on the place where the photo was taken. And I don't have a, I don't have a server, I just have a Wi-Fi connection. So that's really cool. Okay, this one is really cool also. Uh, the story behind it is very cool. Okay. <laughs> Should have configured the screen before. Anyway. Um, so there's an audio tag into, um, into um, HTML5. You just put the file um, in, in the markup. Um, you can play it. You get the user interface that you're seeing over there. Uh, and it's really easy to insert audio files now. 
But some people said, it's not enough, we want access to the sound that is playing, and we want to play with that. So, I'm going to run it. And you don't need to hear the music, that's not the point. <laughs> what you can see here is um, the, the data uh, from the sound that is playing in the background. So, that's something we couldn't do before. It's not really useful, so this way makes more sense. And you can do a lot of violations, but you can also modify the sound. If I don't know if you ever did, but anyway. So you can modify the sound on real time. You can compute um, a Fourier transformation on top of it. Anything. And you can even do 3D that goes with the sound. So the cool thing about that, and I'm going to switch to another one, because otherwise you're not going to listen to me. Um, the cool story about that is that the guys, whoops. OK. The guys who did that, um, so they are, the, the names are on top of it. They um, said, we want this. Um, the W3C was not going to spec it, uh, put it into a, a specification. And so they decided to come to Mozilla and said, OK, we have an ID. We want access to the sound. And we're going to produce the patch and, and, and put that into Firefox. And so they did the code to uh, make it available. They did the specification that now is going to be uh, uh, a standard. Uh, of course, there's discussion with other groups, etc. They did the demo I just uh, uh, showed you. And they also did another one that I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. Uh, and the really cool stuff is that, except for making sure the code is secure and, and not uh, and performant enough, there was no Mozilla employee involved in the creation of this stuff. So that's something you're not going to find in other open source projects, like the one in the other one in Mountain View. <laughs> and so this one, oh, you're not going to see anything. <laughs> nice. Yeah? That's bad. Uh, do you have control over the. No? no? Okay. The sun, yeah, in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, I'm going to run it. Um, ah, yeah, shit. <laughs> no, but it's not enough. Anyway, so uh, this is using WebGL. So WebGL is like OpenGL accessed on the web. Um, and... Um, so there's an audio file that's running the whole animation you're seeing. It's not a video. It's an animation. It's 3D computed on my laptop in real time. Um, so the way to prove that to you, if the network wants to play with us. Okay. Okay. So it's going to go into a city. And you'll see in real time some Flickr photos with the FOSDEM tag in it. Um, they should appear right now. Yeah, in the background. The Wi-Fi is not good enough to download the images on. Sorry. Uh, but trust me, it's really uh, computing on the getting the, the Flickr photos. And another thing. About four minutes, 30. Now the, uh, you can't see it. The buildings over there, they are playing at the same, uh, um, at the same, uh, with the music. I don't know if you, it's really good on my screen. <laughs> Audio, audio API for visualization of the, of the sound? Yeah. So it's, the, the buildings are, uh, light, lights are moving at the same uh, pace, 
than the music. And you can also insert videos inside this 3D animation. So this is a big bug bunny, I think. And so, again, this was done by people who, who liked music and wanted uh, better audio access. And all this computed with a really cool uh, JavaScript engine, uh, 3D uh, with a WebGL and, uh, and all that stuff. Is it okay on time? I have a question. Yes? Uh, also, I, uh, I would like to have the same functionality. Sorry, I can't. I would like to have the anything above the same functionality, namely to create audio uh, uh, on one time. And I saw something, I would, uh, it was mentioned in an HTML5 specification as a device. Uh, they introduced devices. D what devices? Uh, no, it's uh, a device, device yeah. but also audio device. I know that uh, Mozilla has uh, created its own audio archive, but it's also mentioned in Mozilla. It's not implemented yet, but it's also mentioned in HTML5. So, um, I'm not sure what, what you're asking exactly, but no, HTML5 is, is uh, at the same time a specification and, uh, and uh, a bunch of other stuff that. Yes, this was this was. Yeah. Chrome Chrome has as an audio API too. Or am I wrong? It's a device, uh, it's a device API, but it's different. Yeah. Different. The, the, there's a device API. It deals with things like your, um, your webcam and stuff like that. So uh, there's a lot of work in the um, W3C and other, other standards body to get access to audio, like uh, I've just shown, to get access to the webcam, to get access to the microphone, because that's not part of this. Uh, so microphone and, and webcam, this, this is part of the device API that's worked in the work group or something like that. Well, we, sh we should probably take yep. this offline because uh, we, we, we don't have time for many questions. Any other questions? I promise you can grab uh, Anthony on the side. <laughs> yes? Yeah, not very uh, There's been a talk about really add-ons the, the question is, uh, uh, can we sync, um, with Firefox Sync, can we sync uh, add-ons uh, from one, one version of Firefox to the other? The answer is not yet right now, uh, although we're, we're considering, we're working on it now. What's keeping us busy is, is shipping Firefox 4. So all the energy right now is, is on Firefox 4, and I, we'll, see, we'll see once it's shipped, we'll see what we can do with, uh, about extensions. And um, uh, extensions, I think, can already uh, sync their preferences uh, using sync if they, if they choose to do it. So you still have to install the add-on on your new computer, but it will get the it will get the preferences of this uh, extension if, if the extension is compatible with it. If you had to convince somebody who had left Firefox to use Chrome or Chromium to come back to Firefox, what would be your kind of short killer argument if you have one? <laughs> beyond, the, beyond the Evan Modlin, it's freedom and you're not evil, even and that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so if, if I had to. I, I, I think both Firefox and Chrome are very good browsers, uh, re and I should repeat the question. Uh, so yes, why should I use Firefox instead of Chrome? Um, there, that's the question. Uh, and the answer is, well, you should use Firefox uh, because it's made by us. We're a nonprofit organization, <laughs> and our business is not coming from data mining user uh, data. But what if you're a selfish person you, and you're a stupid person, you don't care about? Uh, well, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's nicer. The, the logo is nicer.
Yeah, okay. If you're if you're an asshole, that's all the answer I can give you. No? I, I'm not technical, but uh, I mean... She's blonde. <laughs> Thanks. Thank blonde. Um, I work at Mozilla, but I'm non-technical, and, and the thing that I like is the, the lot of... Um, work that they've done into the UI. So the, the, the uh, features that were showed, like Panorama, I actually can visualize my tabs. I have many windows, many tabs open. I know it's clear. I have a clear visualization. I also have an iPhone. I got Firefox Home on it. I got to play with an Android. And when I go back to the US um, next week, I'm switching to an Android phone because I was able to um, you know, play with sync and really get that same experience no matter what type of device I used. Um, so there is a lot of like different features, it's faster, it's cleaner, and also you can bring it with you no matter what, what you use. And it's just being able to have your Firefox on the go is so important. Like I, when I use another computer and it's not my Firefox, I'm really lost. I'm used to organize my tabs, everything the way I like it, and you can do it now with Firefox 4 and the other options. Thank you. Um, I would like to know if you have any limitations on the hardware participating acceleration system. Do you support NVIDIA? So, uh, uh, is there any limitation about hardware acceleration about the the brand of the the GPU you're using? So, if someone wants to answer that from Mozilla, <laughs> so um, yeah. We're we're kind of working on this right right now. You're asking about Linux, right? The question is exclusively about Linux. Um, all right, so, so then we are right now, I think we only enabled an NVIDIA proprietary driver because this is the only one that doesn't crash. Uh, but we are, uh, so, so this is the sad note, right? Like that's, that's not the story we'd like to hear. But the positive story is that when we, when we started sending uh, the, um, dumps of the crashes, we started getting responses from the uh, X org uh, community much faster than from the, uh, from the vendors. So basically, uh, ATI uh, did not respond at all, while the open source ATI driver uh, started sending patches like two days later. <laughs> so even if we st we're starting from like a really bad position, we, we believe that um, pretty soon we'll be able to uh, enable um, eight, at least a um, Radeon driver. Probably, not sure about no uh, Navu, what's the full name? Oh. Nauvoo. Um, they are also working on this, but they have kind of a complex issue that they are trying to resolve. I think we like th the work is progressing, and we'll be enabling things as we as we go once we see the drivers working. But it it'll take some time to upstream to distributions as well, right? So it's not not going to happen tomorrow. So that's that's the status. And there's a full test suite coming with a WebGL, so that. Makes that's going to improve the whole situation on Linux, not only for Firefox. All right, time is up. Uh, sorry, we couldn't take all the questions. Thank you very much.